privilege to introduce our speaker today, Jenny McGill. Uh, Jenny is the uh, adjunct professor in world missions and intercultural studies and uh, international student advisor here at the seminary. I think it's appropriate she's speaking today. We've had Johnny, an international student, uh, lead us in music worship, and uh, now we have all the Global Proclamation Academy here who are internationals. And here is our international advisor. Let me tell you a little bit about Jenny. Uh, she graduated, obviously, from Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, she is now a candidate for her PhD at King's College uh, in London. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, that conferral uh, sometime in the near future. Let me tell you a little bit more about her. She directs the international office here at DTS, has served in the inter 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 international education since 2000. Um, besides her role in admissions and programming, she manages services for academic, cultural, and immigration issues related to international students. And she serves as intercultural uh, consultant for the global arena. In 2006, she received a Fulbright Award for the International Education Administrator Program to Germany and the Czech Republic. Um, travel for volunteer work, study, and research has taken her to Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, she's going to be leaving. Her husband, who's also a graduate, has the pastoral uh, gift and uh, has been called as the lead pastor of a church in Indiana. And so uh, she's going to be going with him. I'm trying to figure out a way to keep her here and send him to Indiana. <laughs> but uh, that doesn't seem to be working. But uh, we're going to miss Jenny. She is so capable. I, I don't know how to tell you. Uh, how wonderfully capable she is and such a delight and loves the Lord. And so will you welcome with me Jenny McGill. Good morning. At a graduation ceremony of Dallas Seminary a few years ago, the academic dean and advisor at the time, Dr. John Grasmick, requested that all the audience refrain from any applause or hailing or otherwise general noisemaking upon the call of a student's name to receive his, his or her diploma. I remember one particular student on this occasion. He happened to be visually impaired. He slowly crossed the stage with his seeing eye dog and all was silent but for the intermittent jingle of the bell on the dog's collar. It took the length of the stage to realize the immensity of his task to complete a THM. As he reached out to receive his diploma from Dr. Bailey, the audience spontaneously erupted in applause. What a heroic effort. Now when you think of the heroes of Israel, with whom do you identify? Some might say David or Daniel, Joseph or Deborah. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we'll consider another hero with whom we might identify. I'll read 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, 11b and 13. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. Mephibosheth. In many ways, he was helpless. He was in no position to lobby. He was completely at the mercy of King David. And for us in this room today, it is similar, is it not, with our station before God? We are helpless. It was not Mephibosheth's prowess or ability it was not his knowledge of David's pact with Jonathan. No, it was David who initiated kindness, as God does for us, loyally and at his own expense. To eat at the king's table, 
so it is for us. We ought to never lose our wonder that we, we should be called children of God. It's unbelievable. So when you think of what it means to be a hero, when we think of the heroes of Israel, do we think of Mephibosheth? How is he a hero? One thing Mephibosheth might be given credit for was his acceptance of a gift. Instead of spurning his grandfather's rival, he received David's invitation. His heroism resides in the fact that he showed up. He could have avoided or even tried to hide from David. What did he think when David summoned him? When the political enemy of your grandfather calls you to court, what do you think is going to happen? But he showed up anyway. Mephibosheth was a hero to not refuse David. His heroism was in his reception, his gratitude, his humility to receive help in his given estate. I love the picture that this represents for us as believers in God. I love the picture that this represents for us as students in seminary. We come to the scriptures helpless. Helpless if we do not remain dependent on the spirit of God. We cannot think straight. We can't see straight. Our, we think too much of ourselves. Our ability to think, to see, to speak truth is so thoroughly affected by sin. In a very real sense, we are disabled. Yes, God created us to fulfill a special purpose, but our pride, our pride cripples us. Does it not? On a daily basis, we act like we function on our own ability. Aren't we puffed up in our lofty opinions? Take any example in our arguments with our roommate, our spouse, or our children. But if we're honest, at the end of the day, like a local pastor in the area says, John Ariano, we are all carrying around a big bag of nothing, a big bag of nothing in and of ourselves. Of course, you know this already, but we forget. This is the beauty of summer chapels, where we remind ourselves together what we have forgotten. In my role as coordinator of services for students with disabilities here at the seminary, I have had an opportunity to meet some wonderful people, and over the years, I've reflected on their various situations. Let me be clear, I'm not making comparisons between disabilities, as if to say that one is harder than another, or even that they're similar. I don't want to minimize in any way the individual challenges students with disabilities face. My point is only that the gravity of Mephibosheth's physical disability reminds us of the gravity of our spiritual disability before God. Think about what a physical disability would have meant in the late 11th to early 10th century before Christ. The stigma, the inaccessibility. There were no ADA laws to protect the disabled, no ramps, no paved streets. We don't know the extent of his disability, but he possibly, probably would have been carried everywhere, every day. Is it not the same with us before God? Thinking back to the visually impaired student at that graduation ceremony, what a tremendous moment. A miracle of God's grace in this student's great effort. I reflect on that moment from time to time. That we would applause for one physically disabled surely is appropriate. But it shows also how settled in our thinking we can become. As if to think that for everyone else, it's our ability, our knowledge, our fine argumentation that made it happen. But in fact, that any of us have crossed or will cross that stage is a miracle. True heroism is the humility to receive God's power. Heroic effort is most about God being our source of strength in life. So Mephibosheth paints a wonderful picture for us. His faith in a promise did not mean he did not participate. As it is the same for us, the outcome is truly God's doing. We work, we study, in faith and of course diligent effort. But it is done in faith, not self-effort. For it is not our doing, um, it is God's. For it is God's great innervation of grace that stimulates us to action. That heroism resides not in what we give, but what we allow ourselves to receive, God's grace and power. Now, all of us can name our heroes of the faith. One of those heroes for me is my dad. 
He's not a hero because he went to Vietnam, although he did do that. He's not a hero because he stayed faithful to my mom for almost 47 years now, although he has done that. He is a hero because throughout my life, how did I know this was gonna happen? Um, throughout my life, I saw him acknowledge his brokenness, his broken condition before God, and acceptance of God's grace. He didn't get everything right, but his, hero his heroism was that he did not pretend to. His heroism was loudest when he was told he had an aggressive cancer that could have been caught early and uh, treated with routine surgery, but it was found late. The treatment at that point was immediate surgery followed by radiation. His heroism shown uh, not by what he had accomplished in life, but his willingness to accept death with courage. He did not complain or resent God. He did not become angry or bitter or take it out of my mom. He reported for his radiation five times a week and was grateful for the treatment, realizing that every day he was and is still carried by God. We don't know if Mephibosheth tried to posture himself in other ways, but his physical infirmity perhaps made it more difficult to do so at that time. And we have some hint of his humility in verse eight. But let us remember our own infirmity. If Mephibosheth didn't fake it, neither should we. Let us remember the words of Deuteronomy chapter eight, verses 17 through 18. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce this wealth, or pass an exam, or finish a paper, <laughs> or the ability to read, or the ability to see to read. For it is he who gives you the ability, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for forgetting our frailty, that we don't deserve the crumbs off your table, and yet you loyally feed us and bless us every day for the sake of your son, Christ. Thank you for what we have received from you, and help us give you the credit for it. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>